All right, so we're at a really interesting site. This church is the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. For a church, it had some interesting features. Anybody, anybody can think of one particular interesting features? Right. So Dylan said a Star of David. There's a Star of David right in the center above the doorway worked into the, that forms the frame of the stained glass window, right? So, I mean, it seemed pretty clear that this used to be a synagogue. And, you know, I, I was aware of a lot of buildings in the uh, Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan area along Blue Hill Avenue that were, that are churches now, that used to be synagogues. That was the heart of the Jewish neighborhood in the city uh, from about uh, the 10s and 20s up until uh, the 1960s. But I didn't know of one in the South End. And so I looked into it and yes, unsurprisingly, uh, it is a synagogue, or I should say it was a synagogue. And this is actually the oldest still standing synagogue building uh, in the city. You can see over there, there's the cornerstone, which was l laid in 1884. They finished building it in uh, 1885. The synagogue, the congregation still exists. It's today, it's the Temple Israel congregation, the Reform Synagogue that is on uh, Riverway near the hospitals in Longwood area. And this synagogue was built by Jews who came primarily from Central Europe, from German-speaking lands, from what they said was Poland, although it was Prussian Poland, it was a part of Poland uh, taken by uh, Prussia when Poland was partitioned. And even though they built this synagogue in 1884, 1885, at, which was a time of the, pe the peak of Jewish migration from Eastern Europe, these were Jews who had come earlier, had come about 40 years earlier, 40, 30, 40 years earlier in, in the 1840s and 1850s from a different area, from, from Central Europe. We call this the South End today, right? But as we learned from Nancy Seashull's lecture on land making, right? This is, this is actually the new South End, right? This is right here where we are on the corner of Massachusetts Avenue and Columbus. Well, we're on Columbus and that's Massachusetts Avenue. Was in the water, just barely in the water but it was in the water. What, what body of water do we remember? Same as the West End. Back Bay. Back Bay, right. And this area was filled in, right, in the 1850s, in particular, as Nancy Seashulls was talking about, both to expand, you know, where people could live in the city and create new residential areas, and as part of an effort to keep Protestants in the city. The relatively new city government shifted its form of government towards the city for a, uh, with the mayor. It was, as we learned, trying to both fight uh, Irish immigration, right, and to fight the numbers of Irish Catholics coming into the city, right, but also trying to balance that out, to try and balance the numbers out as much as they could by building new neighborhoods, right, that would keep Protestants in the city, both as voters and as a tax base, and, you know, also for sort of, I guess, just sort of basic cultural prejudice. So this was the new South End. These German Jews moved originally in the 1840s and the 1850s into the old South End, which is today uh, essentially the theater district. As this neighborhood was developed and this became a newly constructed sort of middle-class neighborhood, those German Jews who became prosperous, especially in the retail trades, moved into this neighborhood, which was a new, almost, it was within Boston, but almost a comparatively suburban neighborhood, right? And they sought to build a synagogue, right? That would both mark their establishment, their prosperity, right? and at the same time show that they were integrated and that they had, they had sort of uh, blended into the neighborhood. So they hired a German Jew, his name was Louis Weisbein, designed it in the Southern Bavarian style of the time. It was called Rundbogenstiel, right? 
which means uh, round arches. And you can see that there are round arches in different spots. And along the side, if we went to the side of the building, you would see round arches with stained glass windows underneath. To fit in to the neighborhood and, and the sort of Protestant New England identity, instead of putting round arches at the top of these two towers, which would have been the way it would have done, been done according to the style, they put tall peak steeples to look like a New England Protestant church. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that they didn't stay here long, right? The city was continuing to build. Prosperous residents were continuing to move outwards, right? And practically as soon as they got here, they started planning another move where they ended up in between where they are now, where they are now in on Riverway and here which was on Commonwealth Avenue, right? Which was in the middle of Back Bay and was built out. It's actually today the BU's Morse Auditorium. That was the next spot of Temple Israel between this one and the one it ended up at. And, you know, if you go by there on Common Ave, you can see it's built slightly different from this. Both the one uh, on Common Ave and the one uh, on Riverway look more like sort of Athenian temples. They look more like MIT. It was a different style. But, you know, it, it marked, you know, the fact that they moved here and then they were, you know, the community was almost moving again, you know, outward a little bit further um, almost as soon as they got here. So they sold it to a congregation, the uh, African Methodist Episcopal uh, Zion Church in 1902. That is the same congregation that's still here. It's a very important African-American congregation within the city. It was the site of, you know, uh, many early civil, civil rights battles, um, even before the civil rights movement. Um, it was the site of a famous debate in 1911 between Booker T. Washington, who was the head of the Tuskegee Institute in, in Alabama and took a, a sort of a, a moderate integrationist approach um, to African-American efforts to civil equality. And William Monroe Trotter, who was a much more radical activist and founder of a newspaper called the Boston Guardian, which was a newspaper for black civil rights. And like I said, this was long before even the civil rights movement. This was in 1911. And it's since been an important uh, church within the community for organizing uh, and for activism. But one of the things that's really interesting is that this church came from the West End. Now, the West End no longer exists in Boston. It was bulldozed as part of a redevelopment plan that, uh, which is where Government Center is today. The West End was for a long time, and the North Slope of Beacon Hill was for a long time an African-American and free black neighborhood, even during the time of slavery. And it was a place where Jews also moved to. So what was really interesting was that at the time that blacks were moving out of the West End and moving to the South End, right, at that exact time, uh, poorer Jews were moving directly from Eastern Europe and also from the North End where they went to first and into uh, the West End. And they were buying the congregations that the African-American communities were selling to, were, were, were we're leaving, I should say. So you have this essentially an exchange of buildings that's taking place, right? So this was a, a, an offshoot of a congregation founded in, in 1806. They broke away in, in 1838. But that, that group met on Joy Street in the African Meeting House and right around this time sold their building to a Jewish group called Anshe Leibovich that ran it as a synagogue until uh, until the 1970s, right? So what you had was Jews were moving into the West End where African Americans were already li living, right? And both Jews and African Americans were moving in to the South End. And like I said, there was a sort of exchange of buildings going on. But people were leaving the West End, both Jews and African Americans, to come to the South End and, and other groups as well. 
because it was new. It was it was nicer. It was less densely populated. And a similar process happens again when both Jews and African Americans move further south uh, into Roxbury. And that's that's a, actually an important part of uh, the history of both communities in this city uh, has been shared space. So that's our first spot. All right, so we're still in the south end, uh, but now we are in uh, the heart of Boston's Puerto Rican community. And um, I don't know if you've heard the expression, you can't fight City Hall, but all of these buildings around us are actually an example of the fact that sometimes you can fight City Hall. They're here because the Puerto Rican community in the 1960s fought uh, efforts of redevelopment by the city successfully. Back at the uh, Amy Zion Church, I mentioned that the West End of Boston doesn't exist anymore. So it, it doesn't exist anymore because the city seized it by eminent domain, declared it a slum, and bulldozed it to build what's today Government Center and a lot of where MGH is. And people in this neighborhood in the 1960s were very worried about the same thing happened. Of course, in the West End, people lived in the West End when, when it was bulldozed. And this area is called Parcel 19, which was slated for redevelopment. And an emergency tenants council was formed in 1965 called ETC Parcel 19 to fight the city's efforts at redevelopment, which would have you know, made many Puerto Rican families homeless or and got rid of where they lived and bulldozed much of their cultural community. And they spent several years fighting the city. And much of these records, by the way, are available digitally through Northeastern. Northeastern possesses the, uh, or houses the archive for these organizations. And much of it is available digitally. But what they did was they won from the city the right to develop the neighborhood themselves. And actually, this organization, ETC Parcel 19, became the owner and developer of everything around that we're seeing. And the first set of housing was completed in 1971, and then a cultural center, a senior center, and more housing in phases in 74, 75, 76. And these communities, and you can see little Puerto Rican flags hanging from a lot of the, um, uh, the front doors, but these townhouses, communities, were built to, to resemble a Puerto Rican village, at least in its sort of communal space, being set around parks and circulars and integrating elder care, child care, cultural activities uh, right into the community. And they named it Via Victoria. This is where the Puerto Rican community's social activism was based, much of its left-wing politics and left-wing political parties that formed. And there was a significant disturbance or event, series of social unrest in 1972 in Blackstone Park. A fight led to police interference and a rather heavy hand by the police that then led to uh, social unrest. Uh, and three days of, um, of protests, sometimes riots uh, and conflict with the police. And this was in 1972, but it actually really refocused people's concern about Puerto Rican uh, equality and the difficulties that many uh, in the various Hispanic communities within uh, the city faced. So that's a little bit about this neighborhood. And this, this mural uh, was created as a memorial to that 1960s activism, which, like I said, was really an example of very successful communal activism, right? They actually managed to fight off the redevelopment of this area and redevelop it uh, and, and sort of have ownership over the redevelopment um, as a community. And to memorialize that, this mosaic mural was created uh, using about uh, more than 300 tiles made by community members, especially children. Um, as a, as a memorial to that activism. And from here, we're gonna move on to Chinatown. All right, so we are right now at um, the Chinatown Gate, which is, I mean, I guess the unofficial entrance to Chinatown on Beach Street. Chinatown itself is, as you'll see walking around, you know, a very small neighborhood. Uh, and it's a, an old, tight-knit community. 
that's really been uh, a place of Chinese settlement within the city from the 1900s until today. You know, gentrification has taken its toll on the neighborhood and I guess encroachment surrounding businesses and what was Nemec and now is Tufts Medical Center and just generally the cost of living. So that between the 1990 census and the 2010 census, the Chinese population within, uh, or actually I think it's the Asian population, I should say, within the Chinese ta Chinatown neighborhood shrunk from nearly 80% to about 46%, I think, in the last census. So today, Chinatown, at least among its residents, is about half Asian American residents. But it's still, you know, it's still very much a cultural center within the city. Also, like other communities we've talked about, and like the Puerto Rican community in the South End we just came from, the Chinese in the neighborhood formed associations to fight encroachment by the government and other uh, and hospitals and sort of competitors for land, right, to tear down rental apartments that people were living in for other purposes, and also for other forms of assistance and, um, and advocacy and workers' rights within the neighborhood. So in 1977, Chinese Progressive Association was formed, and this is another communal group that Northeastern holds the archives for and a lot are digitized online. And this progressive association was formed initially, I think, primarily to fight for translation services and to have more uh, of necessary municipal services available in Chinese languages, but evolved to fight for workers' rights and community organizing, and in particular led a big battle against Tufts Medical Center, which was Nemec at the time, efforts to build a large parking lot in an area that would take away affordable housing. So this is another neighborhood where there's a strong tradition of communal activism, and it's still a real cultural center. About the gates, anything interesting about that gate? Ever wonder why there are gates in Chinatowns? In like every city you go to, and not just in the United States, uh, in Canada, in Australia, and certainly in a lot of places, that you have these sort of similar gates, right? There's a clue to why that is right on the gate. So one's the American flag. The other one is not the flag of the People's Republic of China, right? Yes, yeah, Taiwan. It's, it's in the corner, that's the Kuomintang, the Chinese Nationalist Party's flag at, with a red background. It's Taiwan's flag. And this is a product of Cold War cultural diplomacy. So in the 1970s, Taiwan or, or uh, you know, the, the Republic of China, not, not the People's Republic of China, paid for the construction of uh, these gates in Chinatown around the world, right? Uh, and it had a sort of a dual role. I mean, one, you know, it kept the connections between Taiwan and the diaspora Chinese communities around the world. But also, like I said, it was a form of Cold War diplomacy. They put the Taiwanese flag on all of these things. And if you went to Chinatown, you know, when I was growing up a hundred years ago, uh, and Toronto has these you know, big Chinatowns as well, and has a gate as well. It has more than one Chinatown, but it has one central gate. But you know, if you go to these Chinatowns, I remember as a kid you know, going to San Francisco or in Toronto, you, know, you didn't see the flag of communist China. You didn't see the flag of uh, the People's Republic of China. You saw the Taiwanese flag everywhere, right? And that was a very conscious act of, like I said, Cold War diplomacy on the part of Taiwan to build connections between, you know, Taiwan, nationalist, non-communist China, and the Chinese diaspora, sort of in competition with communist China. Any questions? Why haven't they changed it? Well, so the, it's, it's a great question. You know, times have changed, and, and these communities only survive through the regular, you know, reinvigoration of, of, of immigrants, right? They survive through more immigrants coming, right? So many immigrants have come, obviously, from mainland China. And so now you walk down, you see both flags, right? The flags of the People's Republic of China uh, and Taiwan. But that's an excellent question. Why leave the, the, the gates up in general? Now the gates, 
I'm not entirely sure if this was what was intended in the first place. Gates now do serve this sort of boundary function, right? It, in sort of marking the, the territory of a cultural neighborhood and, and a protection, right? There's a, it's sort of a function of a monument serving as, as maybe not a physical or spiritual protection, but it has the benefits of marking a place of significance. Chinatown was built on land made from South Cove. So the water came up to here and there were wharfs here. And right around here in the 17th and 18th century, slaves were purchased and sold. And this is a site where perhaps Boston's most famous slave, Phyllis Wheatley, was purchased by John Wheatley and his wife Susanna as a domestic slave. She had been taken from uh, West Africa, probably from the Gambia or Senegambia region, taken to Boston and sold here um, as an eight-year-old. And uh, the Wheatleys, like I said, they owned, they were purchasing her as, as a domestic. They owned other slaves but they seem to have, have taken a particular likely, liking to Phyllis. They named her after the ship she was taken on, which was called the Phyllis. And she had her own room. They apparently treated her very much like her own child, like their own child. They taught her how to read and write. They taught her English, Latin, and Greek. And, and part of this was to turn her into a Protestant and to make her a good Christian. But clearly there was a distinction between how she was treated and how the other slaves within the household were treated. There were, like I said, they kept other slaves. What was significant about Phyllis Wheatley is that she was clearly absolutely brilliant. She became a poet at 19 years old. She published her first book of English poetry. Um, this is somebody who was born in Africa. Native English was not her native language. She was most likely a Wolof speaker, right? who learned the language as a slave here and became a well-known poet. A lot of her qualities obviously were exceptional, right? Like the, the story of Phyllis Wheatley is sort of exceptional. Most slaves, slaves were not treated so well. Most, most slaves, you know, did not, did not become poets uh, as, as young children. And, and not only was, was she a, an African slave, and a poet, she was a woman as well. So there was, you know, there were a, a, a several criteria that were um, that were were significant uh, and and exceptional uh, about her story. Yep. Peterson argues that that actually, you know, Wheatley's story is fairly representative or or a good demonstration of how. Uh, Boston was, you know, this one node in the Protestant or Puritan Atlantic. You know, first of all, her audience, right, was a British Anglo audience. Her book poetry were published in London. She wrote about Christian motifs and also motifs about the British Empire and the greatness of the British Empire. And, you know, her owner was a loyalist, was somebody who opposed the American Revolution and left afterwards. And she was sort of left in a, in, in a position of having, you know, tied much of her own uh, identity to the British Empire itself. You might say, well, why would a slave sort of take up Christian poetry and, uh, or I should say poetry with a Christian motif for celebrating the British Empire, you know, when she was a slave? And I think, you know, and, and had suffered, obviously, even if she had a, a good life by the standards of slavery, was torn from her family in, in West Africa and obviously suffered a great amount. And, you know, historians of slavery in the United States have, have pointed out how becoming Christian, becoming uh, Protestant, um, was what could actually be very empowering for slaves. And in the case of Wheatley, you can see that, you know, that she, by, by becoming a Christian, by, by sort of claiming that she was part of, a, you know, a Protestant member of the British Empire, she could then stand, even as a slave, as an equal with other Protestant British subjects, that this was a way in which she empowered herself. But it's also just a really, you know, important reminder, you know, to the extent to which slavery, you know, was part of the landscape within Boston.
so we're, we're not going to make it to, to Faneuil Hall, but you might have heard about the, the current controversy over the renaming of Faneuil Hall. So Peter Faneuil was one of the richest men in Boston in the 18th century, and he paid for the construction of Faneuil Hall, which was to have it as the marketplace. You know, in, in Boston, uh, Boston residents were, for the most part, opposed to public marketplaces, right? There were a couple reasons. One, some people preferred people to sell around the town, but also pu public marketplaces allowed for retailers or, or dealers, I should say, to, what was, to do what was called forestalling. So it allowed them to go to the people supplying the goods, bringing in to sell the goods, to buy them all and then to resell them to the public at higher higher prices. So the public felt that you know without a public marketplace, you had greater access to the people who'd bring their goods into the city to sell. And the first time the city tried, or the town I should say, tried to, to build a public marketplace, uh, it was torn down by a mob. But Faneuil, this was I think 1737, but Faneuil said, look, I'll pay for the construction of a new fancy one. And it just squeaked by to vote at the time Boston was a town government system where, you know, every property franchise person got a vote. So there was hundreds of people, just people accepting the money to build Faneuil Hall, which was at the top of the old town dock, which was being filled in. But in any event, how did he become, you know, one of the richest men in Boston? Through the West Indies, right? Trading between uh, European goods, right? from Massachusetts with the West Indies, bringing goods back from the West Indies and then trading those with Europe in what was called the Triangle Trade. Of course, all of, of those products were made with slave labor. Peter Faneuil owned slaves as well. Even though, though Boston uh, was not heavily involved in the direct trade for slaves uh, in Africa and Rhode Island was more of a hub for that, some people did do it, and Peter Faneuil was one of them. Uh, Peter Faneuil sent ships to West Africa for slaves. Um, you know, it, in fact, uh, in Jared Hardesty's book, um, he, he has documented the specific orders that Faneuil made for the type of slaves that he wanted for his own house. Um, so this was not just somebody who made his money through, the sla through trading with slave economies and owned slaves, but also was one of the, the fairly small number of people directly involved in the slave trade and sending ships uh, to West Africa to purchase slaves. So, you know, there are a number of people now who feel that that's an inappropriate name for an important public building in the city of Boston and would like it renamed. Many people have suggested to name it after Crispus Attucks, who's known as the, the, the first casualty of the American Revolution, right? He was the first to die in the Boston Massacre in 1770 and was somebody of, of African-American and uh, indigenous uh, descent. The city tried to compromise and suggest, okay, well, we'll build a, a monument essentially to slavery and the slave trade at Faneuil Hall instead. Um, but the NAACP opposed that as this being a sort of a shortcut and the artist pulled out and it fell through. So this hasn't been resolved yet, but you know, there are, it is, these are very small reminders, but important reminders uh, about the role of slavery and the slave trade in Boston, which uh, is often not recognized. All right, so this is our last stop. Uh, we're at 19 Harrison Street, uh, also in Chinatown, which is the site of a famous immigration raid in 1903. This was a, a tenement building with uh, a lot of uh, immigrants from China living in it and working in it um, that was raided by the police. Uh, and in the process, uh, a young man named Wang Yak Chong uh, was killed. The people in Chinatown were outraged by this. Initially, the police and the story that was picked up by the newspapers sought to blame it on the murder uh, on rival gangs and suggest that, that this was actually not, that he was not killed in the police raid, um, but rather um, in, a, in a shootout of sorts between rival gangs. Um, this was clearly not the case. The truth came out and there was a massive funeral right in front of here and in Chinatown where over 3,000 people came out and immigration authorities and the police took that as an opportunity 
to arrest masses of people, uh, hundreds of people. Most of the people of the 3,000 people were had papers and were here legally, and they had to release most people, but 50 were deported who had been arrested at this funeral. And this was a period of, of continued immigration raids and arrests in the neighborhood. So when we think about uh, these immigrant neighborhoods and these different communities within Boston, and we think about the efforts that they have gone through to simply stay within the city and to stay within their, their own neighborhoods, we have to also keep in mind the sort of long, long reach of the government in this area in attempting to keep others out, right? And we heard about this in uh, Professor Hirota's talk where he makes clear that federal policies and immigration restrictions that came to be imposed restricting Asian migration actually had their origins in anti-Irish laws that were created right here in Massachusetts, right? These laws were tech, uh, were targeting the poor and, and public charges, but of course were interpreted broadly and were used to deport thousands of Irish, uh, sometimes illegally uh, and sometimes uh, even citizens. Um, so, you know, when we think about uh, the different communities that live in Boston, um, we have to keep in mind uh, both their successes, um, but also the extent to which they have had to struggle, struggle through their own community organizations um, and struggle through their own activities to keep their place in their neighborhoods within the city. So when we learn about the different communities uh, in Boston, we also have to think about the work that they did on their own to, to maintain their communities, to maintain their presence, um, and to create uh, vibrant cultural communities that will last um, and places that, that they can afford to live in.